While the Ultimate Warrior's win over Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 6 in 1990 is remembered as one of the greatest moments in professional wrestling history, their match at WCW Halloween Havoc 1998 is remembered for the exact opposite reasons. World Championship Wrestling, Eric Bischoff and indeed Hulk Hogan tried to recapture a moment in time, and try as they might, the match turned out to be something that I'm sure both men weren't all too proud of. Warrior was paid handsomely to perform in WCW in 1998 with a hopeful turnaround of old fans tuning in for a heavy dose of nostalgia, and if fans tuned in and purchased the pay-per-view, Hulk Hogan stood to make an incredible amount of money also, thanks to those incentives written into his contract. It's also very possible that Hogan wanted to go over Warrior, securing a win over the man who defeated him all those years ago in Toronto, as if a favourable outcome in the scripted world of wrestling would make Hulk feel better. Warrior himself said he was brought into WCW so Hogan could make up for his loss at Mania 6, but you can draw your own conclusions. Warrior's time in WCW was associated with many bad things, not just the match with Hogan. From the ridiculous camera tricks that presented Warrior with mystical powers, some extremely long promos from the Warrior who wasn't always the most articulate man on the mic, a trapdoor which was used to get Warrior into a war games match but it also severely injured a superstar earlier in the night. There was Horace Hogan and the Disciple who were also involved in the storyline. It seemed like nothing at all good came from Warrior's time in WCW, with maybe the exception of seeing the man on TV screens after his 1996 departure from the World Wrestling Federation. It's a shame too, Warrior did indeed have a legacy in wrestling, but I feel his 1996 and 1998 runs did nothing to help the guy. But anyway, sit back as we take a look at the Ultimate Warrior in WCW. So Warrior wrestled his last WWF match on the 25th of June 1996, a dark match against Vader in Wisconsin. He ended up missing house show dates which eventually led to his contract termination and by and large, Psycho Sid was reintroduced to the WWF in order to fill the void that Warrior left. What you may not know is that Vince McMahon attempted to re-sign the Warrior, as proven in this leaked letter from Vince McMahon himself. Vince was prepared to pay Warrior even more money to come back to the WWF once again, quite shocking considering the past that McMahon and Warrior had with each other. From holding the company up for more money, to wellness violations, to no showing events, Vince McMahon was willing to put this all behind him to bring the Warrior back for a $750,000 per year downside guarantee. Remember too, in 1997, Vince also told Bret Hart that he could no longer afford his contract. This letter is dated December 1997, just one month after the Montreal incident. Warrior didn't sign this WWF deal of course, but it's intriguing to think what the plans could have been if Warrior came back to the WWF in time for WrestleMania 14. The Ultimate Warrior ended up signing with WCW for a reported $1 million. His contract was for two months and three matches, with appearances on WCW television in between. I'm also pretty sure that the Warrior must have known in the back of his mind that one of these matches would be a loss to Hulk Hogan, but anyway, just a quick note that WCW had fooled around with an Ultimate Warrior ripoff during the mid 90s known as the Renegade, but if you want to learn more about that, you can check out my Renegade video. So WCW presented Monday Nitro from Hartford, Connecticut on August 17th, 1998. On this date, the Ultimate Warrior, now known as just Warrior, would interrupt a Hulk Hogan promo in his WCW debut. In regards to Warrior's debut, Eric Bischoff said this on his 83 Weeks podcast. There was a lot of anticipation. Nobody would have ever expected him to be there with all of the hate between him and Hulk Hogan. But there was this built-in, natural promotional effort without having to expand any promotional effort on our part. It was automatic. The wrestling audience wanted to see what was going to happen when these two came together because there was so much natural hate and story in the WWF. 
Hulk Hogan came down to the ring for the second time this evening to cut a promo on Diamond Dallas Page and talk about the upcoming War Games match at Fall Brawl. During the promo, Hulk Hogan said that there was no warrior who can defeat him in WCW in his quest to get the WCW Championship back, and right at that moment, the lights began flickering in the arena. The cameras moved over to the entranceway, and out walked the warrior. The crowd reaction was excellent here, as Warrior made his way down to the ring as Hogan looked on, bottom lip quivering and all. It got even more comical when Hogan said to Warrior, I thought you were dead. But it can't be overstated though just how loud the crowd was here for Warrior, they were happy to see him. This promo here has gotten a lot of flack over the years because it was really long and incoherent. Now to be fair, Warrior's promos, as we all know, were always rambling and insanely nuts anyway. I don't think people should have expected Shakespeare here, but I do agree it went on too long. Warrior's promos were fun in short bursts, the WWF knew this also and used it to their benefit. 2-3 to three minutes of Warrior Madness is great, 5 minutes is hitting the limits, but going close to 15 minutes here like he did during his WCW debut was a recipe for disaster. In total, with entrances, the stuff afterwards and Hogan's spot before Warrior came to the ring, the whole thing ran for nearly 25 minutes. As Eric Bischoff looked on in disbelief as this segment progressively tanked, Warrior rambled on about the virtues of justice, Hogan's self-indulgent actions, fulfilling destinies at the next level, all that good stuff. Of course, Warrior was setting up a match and feud with Hogan here, that much was obvious, but his delivery and the overall time of this promo was not agreed upon backstage. Eric Bischoff said, On his first Nitro appearance was when I knew I was in trouble. Everything else that happened after that was a decree of how bad it was going to be ultimately. When he first showed up and we walked through it and blocked it, the promo time that is, everybody had a good idea of what the first promo was going to be. We knew that we had 8 to 10 minutes. Again, we had flexibility. We worked for the television company that owned us, so there was a little room for margin of error when you're on live. But that first promo, going back to his first appearance on Nitro, it was scheduled to only be 8 to 10 minutes, and somewhere along the 15 to 22 minute mark was when Hulk Hogan and I were staring at each other in the middle of the ring and asking, what on earth is he talking about? We were completely lost, and so was the audience, and director Craig Leathers is screaming in my ears. Everything that happened after that was confirmation that it was going to be really bad. All you need to take away here really is that Warrior was back in WCW, he told Hogan, and I quote, that he wasn't there to beat him because everyone already has, and Warrior would be seeing Hogan next week. A cloud of smoke filled the ring and Warrior disappeared as a Warrior bat sign was displayed in the arena. Look close too, after Warrior disappeared, you can see these fans point out exactly where he is. Now, if you were a fan of the Ultimate Warrior here, as in a Die Hard fan, I'm sure you enjoyed this promo and that's absolutely fine. I will say this, with all the bashing that this promo gets, it done what it needed to do. During this televised hour, Nitro did a 4.97 rating as Raw pulled in a 4.4 on the same hour. During that hour, Raw was putting on Draws vs Bradshaw in a Brawl for All match, Val Venus vs Kantai, and DX vs The Nation, and generally speaking, people chose to watch the Warriors return over these matches. In the end, the whole episode of Nitro done a 4.9 and Raw pulled in a 4.2, so Nitro won the ratings battle on this evening. We could split hairs and argue that Warrior should have pulled in an even bigger rating, we can argue that a higher rating doesn't mean better content, but Eric Bischoff didn't see it this way, it was all about beating Raw in the ratings. Warrior came out the next week on Nitro to some new music, a fast paced generic rock instrumental that allowed Warrior to recreate his old WWF entrance as he ran to the ring. Warrior grabbed the mic here and again he had a bit of a ramble. With a bit of translation, Warrior said that he once looked up to Hulk Hogan, he used to be the man in wrestling, but Hogan sold out when he became a bad guy. 
Warrior was coming after Hulk and really that was it. The One Warrior Nation logo and slogan or saying or way of life or faction whatever it was was also presented for the first time on this night. The Warrior, DDP and Roddy Piper attacked the New World Order later on in the evening and this trio of superstars would represent WCW in the last ever War Games match at Fall Brawl. August 31st 1998 saw Warrior display some supernatural powers when he interrupted a Hulk Hogan promo. Almost immediately after he entered the ring, he disappeared again. And at the end of Nitro, when Hogan was again in the ring with the NWO black and white, the ring filled up with smoke and Warrior reappeared. The NWO were all let out and Hogan ran away. The following week, Warrior attacked NWO members backstage, sending a message to Hulk Hogan. The show ended with Hogan and Warrior locked in a steel cage, but Hogan again managed to get away. The War Games match in 1998 then saw Team WCW featuring Roddy Piper, DDP and Warrior taking on Team Hollywood of Stevie Ray, Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan and Team Wolfpack featuring Sting, Lex Luger and Kevin Nash. Some big names in this match for sure but this War Games match ended up being one of my least favourites. When Hogan went to pin Kevin Nash for the win, the ring again filled up with smoke and Warrior appeared. The ring again filled with smoke, Warrior disappeared but this time Hogan was left holding his jacket. Warrior then ran down the entranceway, he got in the ring and started beating up Stevie Ray and Hogan. Hogan again ran away, leaving the cage in fear of the Warrior. Warrior ended up kicking out a top panel of the cage, getting his hands on Hogan for a moment before security broke up the scuffle. DDP ended up getting the win for Team WCW. For the fake Warrior to disappear and reappear during this War Games match, a trapdoor was used in the corner of the ring. Earlier in the evening, the British Bulldog took a bump on the trapdoor, a bump that would cause Davy Smith some serious problems going forward. Davy developed a spinal infection from bumping on the trapdoor, leading to him staying in hospital for around 6 months and ultimately getting released from WCW. So you can clearly see what WCW was doing here. Hogan was extremely afraid of the Warrior, he ran away at every given opportunity and Eric Bischoff was trying to build some anticipation for their inevitable WCW matchup. The September 14th 1998 edition of Nitro then, even if you aren't into the Warrior stuff you should still watch this show if only for the excellent Ric Flair return promo. I believe this Flair promo ranks up there as one of Nitro's greatest ever segments but anyway back to the Warrior. Hogan challenged Warrior to a match at Halloween Havoc on this night which was odd seeing as Hogan was constantly running away from Warrior at every given chance but anyway during this challenge promo Smoke again filled the ring and when the ring was cleared, the Disciple was gone. The Disciple had been with Hogan during this promo but he had just vanished. Spooky stuff. Later that night, Warrior appeared in the ring with the Disciple and he accepted Hogan's challenge to a match at Halloween Havoc. The Disciple would now begin playing a bigger part in this storyline, take from that what you will. So the September 21st 1998 edition of Nitro and the show opened up with another smoke filled ring. When the smoke cleared, the disciple could be seen laying face down in the centre of the ring. The NWO walked out, smoke filled the ring again and the disciple had disappeared. I like how Scott Steiner couldn't have cared less about all this warrior spooky business and instead he was more concerned about flexing to the cameras. Moments later, Warrior was seen in the rafters with the Disciple. Another mental Warrior promo followed and now the insanity would be turned up a notch. Warrior lured Hogan backstage later in the broadcast where Hogan found a One Warrior Nation logo burning in his locker room. He found the Disciple laid out beside a toilet like he had some seriously rough food earlier in the day and I'll give you one guess as to what happened next. If you guessed that there was smoke and somebody disappearing, you'd be absolutely right. The Disciple once again vanished as Hogan began freaking out. Later in the night, 
The disciple revealed he had joined the One Warrior Nation as Eric Bischoff expected us all to care. The next week, thankfully, there wasn't that much to report. The disciple came down to the ring for a match and remember he was now a member of the One Warrior Nation but he still had NWO entrance music. No idea why. Warrior came out for a promo later in the show and the highlight of this segment was a fan trying to get into the ring. The following week then was the one that most fans remember thanks to how ridiculous the whole Supernatural stuff had gotten. Warrior was featured in a pre-taped segment earlier in the show where he talked about his past with Hogan, not afraid here to talk about WrestleMania 6 while saying that history has a tendency to repeat itself. Later on in the evening, Hogan went backstage to try and find the Disciple. When he got to his locker room, he looked in the mirror and saw the Warrior. The thing was, Hogan could see the warrior, we could see the warrior at home, but Eric Bischoff couldn't see the warrior. So was Hogan really going mental? Were we going mental? Or was Eric Bischoff going mental? It was indeed very ridiculous, but to be fair, people always point to this segment, but as you've seen in this video, Warrior was teleporting around arenas and making dudes vanish on a weekly basis. This mirror stuff here was pretty silly, but it was just as silly as the stuff we had already seen. Still, it remains one of those moments in Nitro history that always gets brought up. The October 12th edition of Nitro saw the reunion of the Blade Runners. The Warrior and Sting teamed up to take on Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart in the main event. No matter what you may think of WCW during this time period, this was one star studded match right here. Warrior didn't get much action though, he didn't even bother to take his jacket off as he stood in his corner wearing a pair of jeans and wrestling boots. When Warrior did get tagged in, Brett was the sacrificial lamb for a few moments before the NWO hit the ring. A beatdown followed and the show went off the air. This one is kinda worth watching just for the stars who were in this main event tag team match, but for actual in-ring wrestling, this should have served as a warning for what was to come. Ok, we have but one more Nitro to get through before the Halloween Havoc match pitting Warrior against Hogan. Hogan made his way down the ramp and asked for Horus to come to the ring. Hogan then asked Horus to tell people his real name, leading Horus to answer that his real name was Horus Hogan. Hogan went on to explain that Horus was his nephew and he was willing to give Horus a fast track membership into the New World Order. Just a quick side note, in real life Horus was indeed Hulk Hogan's nephew. Anyway, Hogan said he had let Horus fight his own battles, but now was the time for Horus to stand side by side with his uncle. It was a big swerve, Hogan began attacking Horus, but what is notable here is that there was zero crowd reaction, as in absolutely nothing. Go back and watch this segment yourself and you'll see what I mean here, the crowd noise just didn't change from the promo to the beatdown. Anyway, Warrior runs down to make the save, but he ends up getting chokeslammed by the giant. Hogan sprays NWO on Warrior's chest, drops a few leg drops, and we are off to Halloween Havoc 1998 in Las Vegas. Tony Schiavone begins the broadcast by saying that Hogan vs Warrior will be the greatest return match in the history of professional wrestling. After the first match, Hogan comes out to cut a promo, promising us all that he will beat Warrior later in the evening. The match was in the semi-main spot, the main event on this evening featured WCW Champion Goldberg defending his title against DDP. And yeah, I don't think there's much I can say here that hasn't already been said. Warrior vs Hogan at Halloween Havoc 1998 was an incredibly bad match. Words can't do it justice on how bad the timing was, how bad the big spots were, everything about the match was just really ill conceived. I always try to find the good in things like this, I try to give an alternative outlook on stuff that's been drilled into our heads over the years, but I can't do it for Hogan vs Warrior at Halloween Havoc. If there's one positive I can highlight, it's the quite empty highlight of seeing Hogan vs Warrior in the ring once again after all this time, but the match does a great job of showing us that both Hogan and Warrior were way better performers back in 1990. Eric Bischoff called this match the worst he ever witnessed, 
Mean Gene Okerlund, a man who goes way back with Hogan and Warrior, called it a disaster, with Tony Schiavone echoing these sentiments also. There's an incredible amount of stalling at the beginning of the match as the pair circle around the ring and Hogan roams around the outside, something that the commentary team calls smart wrestling by the Hulkster. After a bit of brawling, Hogan and Warrior go through their classic test of strength routine and then Hogan and Warrior run on opposite sides of the ropes, crisscrossing each other for absolutely no apparent reason. The fight spills to the outside as both men gingerly bump around the guardrails and ring posts, then back in the ring there's a ref bump that leaves Nick Patrick sprawled in the corner. Hogan calls for the troops and the warrior takes out the NWO easily, but this buys Hogan some time to get offense into Jim Helwig. What then happens is one of the worst spots in the whole match, with Warrior comically rolling around the mat to avoid Hogan's elbow drops and his final roll actually taking Hogan off his feet. By this point the crowd was absolutely flat, there seemed to be no saving the match as people realised that Hogan vs Warrior in 1998 could never live up to the nostalgia that both men created all those years ago. Up next came the big botch that most people remember. Hogan had some flash paper which he was going to light and throw at Warrior's face, creating an illusion that Hogan had just launched a fireball. First of all, it took Hogan forever in the day to light the flash paper, and when he did light it, it burned out too quickly and the spot was totally missed by a mile. The commentary team was lost for words when the planned big spot of the match was missed, and Warrior was forced to just continue beating down Hogan as if he didn't just try to set his face on fire. The crowd could be seen laughing at the missed spot and yeah, this was it, the match was now dead in the water. Soon afterwards, Horace Hogan was seen walking to the ring holding a steel chair. Horace ended up hitting Warrior, not Hogan, with the chair. Hogan gets the pinfall win and it's over. Hogan tells Horace that he had passed the test and Horace is now a member of the New World Order. And that was that. Warrior was paid 1 million for this run so far. This incredibly bad and ill conceived match being the cherry on top of what was really a dark spot in the career of the Ultimate Warrior. Wrestling journalists and the wrestling media destroyed the match, many saying it was one of the worst wrestling matches of all time. Now, I've seen worse, you've seen worse, but the problem here was that this was Hogan vs. Warrior. No matter what happened, they were never going to live up to their match in Toronto. Many people forget that we actually had two more appearances from the Warrior in the weeks that followed. The next night on Nitro, Warrior cut a promo where he said more or less that Hogan took the cheap way out at Halloween Havoc and his pinfall victory means nothing. But as we all know, I'm pretty sure that that pinfall victory meant a lot to Hulk Hogan in a weird personal and professional way. Horace the Giant Hogan and Bischoff took a few bumps from Warrior during the closing moments of this segment, while Mike Tenay says on commentary that this is the way to start a revolution in pro wrestling. I think we are a bit late for that one now, Mike. Two weeks later, the NWO attacked the Disciple, and if you recall, the Disciple was a member, the only other member, of the One Warrior Nation. Warrior hits the ring to make the save, and we never see Warrior in WCW again. All in all, the whole return was memorable for all the wrong reasons unfortunately. And yes, I am sure there are big Warrior fans out there who enjoyed this, but at the same time, there's also big Warrior fans out there who will defend anything he ever done during his career, both inside and outside the ring. The general consensus here is that the whole run wasn't good, and as stated earlier, I try my best to find the good in wrestling's more questionable moments and matches, but I really do struggle to find any real highlights when talking about the Warrior in WCW. The only exception I can make here is that it sparked a little nostalgia, but that nostalgia was arguably ruined at Halloween Havoc 1998. 
Halloween Havoc didn't feature Ultimate Warrior's final match though. In 2008, Warrior had his final match against Orlando Jordan for the new Wrestling Evolution promotion. Warrior won this match, held in Barcelona, Spain, and to be honest, it's miles better than the Hogan match from 1998. The next time Warrior was featured on any kind of notable wrestling show was in 2014, when Warrior was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. And to be honest, it did really seem like Warrior was now at peace with wrestling in general, and it also seemed like he was at peace with some of his old peers and enemies.